another backpack coin. <laughs> Welcome to the Backpack Show, where we talk about success and bring you insights from unusual places. Hi, Coach Woodard. Hey, one of our uh, one of our sponsors sent us this graphic. So uh, every now and again, we'll put up Joe Polizzi's content and graphic. His book comes out tomorrow. He'll be a guest on uh, Wednesday, Thursday. One of the he'll be a guest on one of the days. Joe Polizzi. So he was a sponsor. So thanks, Joe. Mm, bag of money. It's really cool, but we needed three boxes because we have a guest. So <laughs> well, they, you know, use it only know? sometimes. Why don't you tell everyone who we're going to talk to you today? It's very Casey exciting. McKinnon. I am so so excited. We haven't talked in person, I think, since '08, mm, probably. She's Maybe an actress 08, and producer. Yep, actress, stage producer, and screen, uh, all kinds of awards, and uh, a scholar of Shakespeare, a super sci-fi nerd, like crazy gamer. Uh, all kinds of things. So we're going to talk about a new Chimera project, and we're going to talk and learn a little bit about that. It's and a mentorship program for women and non-binary people in film. That one. And we have all kinds of things to get handled today. And I, to me, it's just like old home days, too, because it's getting a chance to catch up with someone that we haven't seen in a tiny, tiny bit. And she's so lovely. She is at least extra lovely. Boom shakalaka. Welcome to the Backpack Show with your hosts, Chris Brogan and Carrie Gargone. Boom shakalaka. So Casey contributed to an article I was doing, oh my gosh, like eight years ago about the dark side of social media and how some people are really mm. creepy. And I needed a great quote to close it out. And hers was, treat every woman on the internet like she's your sister, unless you're like into your sister and then maybe just stay off the internet altogether. <laughs> That's a good one. It's a great good advice. Very... Hey, yeah. Leslie, good to so, see you. It's a good guideline. I think we should uh, probably point out this as well, too. Guests of the show stay at the inconveniently located from downtown or anywhere, never to be confused with luxurious and never updated FDR Hotel, located somewhere off Highway 84 near an old gas station with a burned out van parked out front with a for sale sign. Putting the F in accommodation. It's about all the shenanigans we could do. Let's grab Casey on here and get a chit chat going. Well, how are you, Casey? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Best day so far today. <laughs> you we have this I, exchange backstage, but I you know, know Chris it, has to use the same response out it. front. Twice. Um, so uh, you were uh, born and uh, bred and around the lands of Montreal. So some of our yes. Canadian friends will be very happy to hear that. You know, the old days of watching Music Plus and uh, catching <laughs> a little bit of much music all up there. You have been in film in, in one way or another and doing independent film uh, and internet film for a very long time. So we met because of Galacticast, which when we met, that was one of the coolest things on the whole internet. And people would all just nerd out and share that information. And that's it's it's like no fun to start an interview as far back as 2008 when you have all this new stuff to talk about. But But that's when. One of the things I like mm. about starting with you and I, I starting with this background is to say that you've kept who you are through all these various changes. So moving out to California, you know, pursuing, you know, mainstream and real people kind of film and all that sort of a thing. You never turned your back, as some do, uh, on, on who you were in sci-fi and all that. I, I wanted to hear about that a little first, sort of your, your career arc from when the stakes weren't as high to when you maybe thought maybe I'll be super serious to when you decided who you are right now. Thank you. Thanks for bringing that all up. I mean, it's funny because uh, I meet so many people now and they just, um, they have no idea that I started as an actor by just making stuff on the internet. Um, and they're kind of shocked, you know, uh, when they hear about stuff that went viral so long ago. And sometimes they're like, wait, I think I saw that, you know? And even when I was uh, studying at the best acting school in the world, the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, there was a guy who started looking at me differently in the cafeteria. He was just like, and it, you could tell he was like, I don't know, really uncomfortable or he had that fanboy energy to him. Um, and I'm like, what is it, dude? What's going on? And he's like, I Googled you. <laughs> and, 
and I watched Robo Jew, and then I watched <laughs> Heat Fozzy, and I saw you on Tabletop with Will Wheaton, and it was just like, yeah, I did that stuff. It's true, you know. I mean, I I love doing that stuff. Um, and it's funny because uh, you have to have fun in what you do. So even if you're, you know, even when I was playing Jackie Kennedy on stage and I was doing it in a Shakespearean context because I was actually, it was, it's a production of Julius Caesar that we had changed so that it was, um, so that it was telling the story of JFK's assassination. Um, so even when I was doing that, which you, you would think is so serious, I would find all these moments where, you know, I'm just walking around my daily life. I'm, I'm listening to songs that I love and I would hear something that, that just goes back to the Kennedys. And I would make a mental note because I was studying the Kennedys so much. So, you know, there's a Misfits song um, about Jackie, um, which is really sick, uh, but awesome. Um, probably not so good for women, <laughs> um, you know, but you know, when you're a kid, you love that stuff. Uh, and it was something I was into and, and it just like, everything just comes back. And one thing that I've been thinking about a lot about my past is about how every single thing that I've done, every bit of, um, every bit of every song that I've loved, you know, the fact that I did synchronized swimming when I was a teenager, everything has a ripple effect on my life and it comes back eventually. And one thing, even with the, um, the Chimera project, how, you know, we're launching this uh, mentorship program um, called support her. Even that is just from years, you know, years of passion. Um, the, the idea that I used to work at the UN, you know, um, when I was working at the UN, I worked for the Japanese government and I learned, I learned so much. And that is something that, oh, that comes back, you know, See, when I didn't know they the needed project. synchronized swimmers at the UN. <laughs> well, they needed graduates of East Asian studies from McGill. So that's what happened there. Yeah. Well, somebody found LinkedIn. What do you know? <laughs> Wikipedia. Um, life, life is so strange. And it, it's just so weird that like, I've done all these weird things. And sometimes, you know, when I meet new friends, and I'm, they're like, Oh, tell me about your past. It's like this really long, weird conversation, you know, where I talk about being a martial artist and being a synchronized swimmer and being, you know, a punk rocker, and, you know, making films on the internet. You know, I'm seeing this uh, in time just lapse. Like, <laughs> like you have a long faces conversation. Are like, what is going on? You know, like you did that too. Oh, oh, oh wow. Okay. You had um, a storied career. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, I know it's weird, but that's, no, no. Life, right. It's that's amazing. Everybody does, right? It's just that yeah. a lot of us start out like as a chambermaid in some Cape Cod hotel or like working in a bakery <laughs> or something else. You know, we don't all jump right to doing what we love doing on the internet or somewhere else. It's like you made your own way. That's what's so cool about it. Thank I think. you. And the Thank thing you. is, we barely scratched it all. I mean, there's an entire kit cast part of life. There's this, all these other pieces of you. And now there's this moving forward. I mean, I remember watching one of your uh, films that you had put together. It was dead middle of the, the, the pandemic. And it was, hmm. Hmm, which one was it? Was it crossover? Crossover point. point. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, wow, it's so weird sort of seeing, you know, I, I just kept overlaying 2008 you to that and thinking this is, I guess, where it goes. Yeah. You know, no, no better time than now. I mean, we have such a m amount of time ahead of us for the episode, but why don't we talk about now and why don't we talk about what's going forward just so we can sort of fill it in from the, from the back and the front. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, right now I've been working the, the past year has been a challenge obviously for everybody. And, uh, as you were mentioning last year, I had worked on a, on a short film which was written and directed by Anthony Johnston, who's the creator of Atomic Blonde. Um, so of course I was all in when he approached me and uh, I've known him for many years. I, I knew him because I interviewed him 
uh, for his work in comic books. And um, I, um, you know, he came to me, it was amazing, I loved it. And then it was done. We made this short film and it was like, great, what do I do next? Um, do I write something myself? You know, and one thing that really took up my time that started taking up my time is becoming an ambassador for the Chimera Project. One thing that we do is we, we normally, in the normal times, we attend um, film, film festivals and try to champion the women at those film festivals. Uh, but in the pandemic times, we had to do that remotely. So I was attending film festivals. I was, you know, remotely trying to get to know people, sharing, you know, whenever I saw something amazing, I would make sure that I shared it uh, so that I was uplifting um, all these women. And it's interesting because one thing that started to happen is I started to notice the non-binary filmmakers more. And I started to ask myself, well, where do they fit in? Do they fit into our organization? You know, do, should I include them? And I made the decision that absolutely we should because they face very similar issues in the industry. And I wanted to make sure that they were included. So while, while all this was happening, we got this idea to make a mentorship program. So I made this, uh, we decided to call it Support Her. And it's a membership, a mentorship program for women and non-binary filmmakers. Oh, that's a that's a mouthful. It's a mouthful. I'll get I'll get it right. Blah, I should just like exercise my mouth or something. Um, you do that, but, right? Everybody does that before they do a new role. <laughs> yeah, do those mouth exercises. Exactly, exactly. I didn't do that before this. See, see, that's my <laughs> problem. Um, but yeah, so we we launched support her last week. And we're already getting submissions. It's really exciting. We have six inaugural mentors that I'm really excited about. Four are personal friends of mine that I've known for years. And, um, and I'm just so excited to have them on board. Um, I approached them and, you know, it was really sort of like a hell yeah moment um, because they're like, I'd have people responding immediately to emails, which, you know, when you email people, it usually takes a while for people to get back, but um, so it meant something when I reached out to these people and they responded immediately with so much excitement. Um, I even gave, sent them a questionnaire to fill out, you know, to see like, well, like what kind of mentorship are you interested in? Um, and so like some of those questionnaires were, you know, returned back to me immediately. Um, so, so yeah, so it was, it was a wonderful experience and I'm just so happy to have all these great people on board. We've got uh, Mark Bernardin, who um, recently worked on the second season of Star Trek Picard. We've got uh, Marissa Tancher Rowan, who is co-showrunner of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. We have Alexis Ostrander, who's a director who has worked on um, Supergirl and Riven Riverdale and uh, oh Bear McCreary, personal friend of mine who is an incredible composer, who worked on Battlestar Galactica. Cur he's currently on Outlander, and I mean he's just doing everything. And uh, and of course we've got Joe Chensoplano, who is um, he's a VFX guy, and it's funny because you know we write we write that he's working on Eternals, uh, which comes out later this year. But he worked on all the Guardians of the Galaxy, like all the Avengers movies, a um, bunch of just just like almost every Marvel movie. Um, his body of work is so impressive. Um, so I just know that there's someone out there who is like, whoa, this is exactly what I want to be doing. And this is the perfect mentorship for me. Oh, and Tosca Musk. I'm so glad Tosca you kept Musk. this up. How could you miss Doodle. her? <laughs> yes, I know. There she is. Uh, Tosca Musk, who's a director. And and it's funny because I, I've i known her for so many years. I know her from when she was working on Tiki Bar TV as a producer. And now she is a director and she is uh, CEO of Passion Flicks. Uh, they, they make a lot of romance films. Um, and, uh, and there's some supernatural, there's some fun stuff in there. It's not just romance, 
I know personally, I am a fan of time travel romance. So, uh, so yeah, never knock the romance, you know? No, definitely not. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth yeah. says, this is amazing and great tip to treat not just sisters, but all like siblings you like. That you, thanks for qualifying. I don't like some of my siblings. So, <laughs> so what are your, what are you envisioning then for the future? Like, what is the future that the Chimera project is working towards? So it's fascinating because for the actual mentorship program um, for support her, we have specific things that we'd like to do right now. The mentorships are remote, but in the future, we'd like to do them in person. Uh, we'd also like to have scholarships to help women and non-binary filmmakers on their path. And we also want to include job shadowing so that um, people can shadow other shadow their mentors and really get a hands-on, you know, feel for what they should be doing. Um, and like learning on the job, basically. So um, important. And, and, and actually, so difficult <laughs> for some people. To get. Well, it's difficult for some students. Like if you go to a traditional college, they teach you kind of film theory and stuff like that. It could be a long time before you get your hands on a camera and start doing some actual work, unless you do it yourself, you know, but that costs money. Equipment costs money. So, yeah. I think getting people out there doing the work is just so important. Well, you learn so much when you're there, when you're there in person. Sometimes, you know, you you go to school, you, you know, you check all the boxes, you do all the things you're told you're supposed to do. And then when you actually show up on set and you see what the director's doing, if you're trying to be a director, say you're shadowing a director, you see what the director is doing and maybe the director is not doing that. Or maybe maybe the director's doing this extra thing. Um, so there's there's a lot to learn when you actually see someone doing it in person. Sometimes you might you might just shadow a director and find out they don't they don't really write anything down, you know? Um, <laughs> Somehow, <laughs> um, right? Some people don't. Sometimes sometimes a director might have a lot of privilege uh, and may have got the job from that privilege and doesn't do all the stuff that, you know, you think they're supposed to do um, or hasn't really prepared ahead of time. Um, what? But like, yeah, yeah. I mean, it happens, right? Um, and I find we find that um, women work really hard to get those jobs and they do that extra work because they know that they have to. We're hoping eventually we can have a lot more equality in the industry and we just, we need to get there, but we need to create those opportunities and lift up our sisters and siblings to get them there. There's so much opportunity to do better with that. I mean, the fact that as you look through all the various years of people in say the Oscars alone, just, just that one touch place, you know, for, for every Catherine Bigelow, it's almost like, you know, who did a Hurt Locker, who directed Hurt Locker, there's there's one of her to like a gazillion males. It's always you know there's so many more males, uh, and then once we get to you know white males, um, you know then it's even worse and crazier. But to your point about the different directors too, that must be a great opportunity for people getting into the space as well because everyone's so different. I heard uh, uh, Tom Hanks once said that the way um, Clint Eastwood directs is he'll just say, "Okay, go on," and then <laughs> people will start acting. And he won't say a thing and like a whole long time will pass. And then, you know, you, you start sort of thinking out, well, I guess I'll try some other stuff and they'll try some stuff and then he'll finally go, okay, that's enough. And then he <laughs> just goes on and I thought that's not, you know, there's none of this and all yeah. that. And he just yeah. said in his mind, that was very intrusive. So he just wouldn't do that. And I guess it, you know, from your experience is that when you, when you're behind all of that instead of the talent and you've you're you have way more credits behind than you do in front at this point now you've which i never believed would happen i thought you'd forever have more you know uh, on on screen presence tech credits do you do you find yourself sort of cataloging these different styles and thinking about how you want to which ones you want to take with you in that sort of thing well it's funny because uh from speaking from the perspective of an actor um you know i I, I work with a lot of directors and um, I see so many different styles and I see what works for me because, because it's, it's always a, a give and take between actor and, and director. Um, 
and I know what works for me. And I actually find women directors work better for me because they know how to speak to me. Um, because they're trying to get the best performance out of me. Um, and I find that I, I have I have found from my experience that there are a lot of um, a lot of men will be more interested in the technical and uh, the, the the frame. You know, like is the frame good? Is the shot good? How's the lighting? You know, that kind of thing. Whereas women will focus on making sure you, they get a good performance and um, you know working with the actor on the backstory, uh, working with what they're, what they're dealing with right now and just working, like working with the actor. And it's, it's, it's a balance of those, those things. You know, when you're a director, you're in charge of a lot. Um, and so, yeah, so it's, it, it is a balance and it's, um, you know, that's just from my experience and everybody's different. Um, but yeah, I've been very impressed with women directors. Um, and I, and, you know, even just speaking about, you know, inequality in the industry, and it's not just about women directors, it's, uh, it's about producers, it's about writers, it's about, it's about composers, it's about VFX, it's about stunt people, it's about so many things. And if we don't have equality at all those levels, then it shows. It shows in way in different ways because the output, um, you, you know, you can you can just tell. Sometimes the story just doesn't feel right, and you're wondering like, why why does this just not feel right to me? And it might just be because there was gender inequality, or you know, not enough diversity or not enough representation. So you didn't have someone to stand up for you and say, ooh that shouldn't be in there you know because yeah even if if you're one woman on set it's really hard to stand up for yourself um and i i i remember hearing i think it was helen mirren who was talking about working in the 70s and how she wa she tried to stand up but there was only one or two other women on set there was a makeup girl and there was a script supervisor and everyone else were men. And it was just, it was just too difficult. You know, you raise it once and it's really your only chance. Uh, so yeah, so it's important. And, I, and it's not just for women. It, it is for non-binary people. It is for LGBTQ people. It is for different minorities as well, because, you know, we're, we're seeing, we're seeing the world right now. We're seeing black people getting their say and we're seeing them hire people at all levels. And we're seeing a more powerful story being told. So that's what we need to see in all of these categories. And this is a long play. So you get more people scholarships so that they can study the things you know that they to get them into the industry and the positions they want to be in they get there and then they can reach back and help other people come up too and then pretty soon you have this exponential effect so eventually you know we hope that the industry will be more representative but how quickly do you think that that can happen because i mean really it's like we're way way behind we are way way behind but there is an awakening happening right now and a lot is happening behind the scenes I'd like to see, I'd like to see studios start to say that, that they want a certain percentage um, of gender representation. Um, um, and, and the same thing, you know, goes for LGBTQ representation and for, um, for, um, yeah, people, people from uh, different communities, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it needs to happen. And actually what we're seeing right now is uh, BAFTA announced a while back, I think it's been it's been two years or something, where uh, the the only films that will be considered for awards have to have a certain amount of diversity. And 
what so what we're seeing out of the uk is we're seeing more productions that um that are have diverse uh casts um i think that should happen at all levels obviously not just on the acting level but and, and i think i think i heard rumblings of this happening with the oscars as well but of course they're they're talking about it in the distant future this isn't going to happen right away but they're saying you know uh, I don't know if it's five years from now, but whatever it is, they're saying, look, we've had enough, you know, we don't want to do another Oscars where it's hashtag Oscars so white and it's time to change and we need to do it. So they're setting, they're figuring it out, they're finding the date and they're making it happen. Um, and I think that's, I, I really feel like the next decade is going to be very interesting to see what happens. We're going to take a quick little break. When we come back, I've got a bunch of questions to ask you, most specifically about Will Wheaton and Tabletop and <laughs> many other things. Okay, hang tight. Stick around. Don't go too far. More nerd talk coming your way. Oh, my gosh. I've been holding that back. All right. Listen, we got to do some ads. Um, people pay the bills. Too fast. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, hey, we're sponsored by StreamYard. Quack. See Brogan.me so streamyard. You can make your own show just like this. <laughs> hey, want a dot online domain? I mean, really, who doesn't? You can get one for a whole buck. See Brogan.me slash online. Just a dollar. Yeah. Use the code Chris, all caps. Don't mess that up. Can't they just one. also give you the code Chris with a different case? It's and seems... then like, you know, uh, SpongeBob know. text and all that. Yeah. yeah. Hey, like us, but hate our faces. Go to <sighs> castos.com. Get your own podcast. You don't want to look at Chris's face anymore. Uh, listen to the audio podcast right. which is available everywhere you listen to podcasts because castos.com made it possible for us so what if there were two search engines and one of them was trying to get as far into your life as it could <laughs> it wants to know everything you've ever it's up in your business <laughs> and the other one is like your little pal and it doesn't uh -huh. care what you do it doesn't judge presearch.com the little search engine that could presearch.com it doesn't judge <laughs> it doesn't judge you could you could type in weird things like I don't understand that anime. What was that thing? Uh, you're all set. And new sponsor for this week. New sponsor for this week. Not counting uh, Joe, by the way. Look, Content Inc. Sponsor. Thanks, Joe. Get your copy updated. Yeah, Content Inc. Things. New version. Brand new. Like this second. Uh, and Nonfiction Research came here uh, because they have a new project that they're working on called Saving Americans from the News.com. 50% Americans are frustrated with bias coming from both the left and the right side. Right. So saving americans from the news.com thanks ben and everybody there for your bag of money i appreciate it That's, you are you ridiculous know. i am ridiculous. i am so, don't you ever wonder it's like can we just get the news like i just want to watch the news <laughs> so many right. people so bringing their own bias go to, to saving it. america from the news and see if you can <laughs> oh thanks elizabeth you are gorgeous thank you Christmas and your eyes, eyes are watchable, are watchable. <laughs> wow see? I'm bringing you back. Just like bringing sexy back. Yep. Okay. Would you quit that, please? I mean, Someone has to know. honestly, just when I think I haven't used this yellow card in a while. Yellow card broken. You know, what else is new? <sighs> it's a guy to do. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Casey, we all went through it where we kind of teased Will Wheaton way back in the day because, come on, Wesley was not exactly the best character ever created no, in the Star Wars Pantheon. However, Will Wheaton is very cool. How? So please tell me that nothing, like he's exactly who he is in real life uh, on the set of Tabletop and Off. It's interesting. He's, yeah, he is really cool. <laughs> he is really cool. There's a there's a dark edge to him oh. that I think that um, a lot of people don't get to see. Um, mm. But he's like a cool badass kind of dark guy. So he Is he a heel? And stuff? Do you take I a don't heel know what turn? That means. Like on know. like on wrestling, somebody will be like a really you know nice oh, heel character, and they take a heel no. turn and they become bad no. guy. No, I mean he's just a normal guy, you know. Oh, dang um, it. And, and yeah, I think he is a lot like his, uh, he is on tabletop, but of course, you know, we are, when we're not on, you know, when we're not on camera and we're not like appearing to be happy all the time, uh, we have, we have other ways of being. And so I find that he sometimes has a dark edge to him. He's, I actually first 
met him because uh, we have a mutual friend named Sean Bonner. I don't oh, know Sean. if you, you know Sean Bonner? I do. So actually, uh, when I first met Sean Bonner, he came to stay with us and we we knew that he was gonna, he was gonna stay at my apartment uh, for in exchange for appearing on Galacticast. Oh. This is how we procured <laughs> actors back in the day. We were like, oh, Sleepover. you're gonna be on? <laughs> be on our show, yeah. So, um, and we knew that he was friends with Will Wheaton. So we thought, wouldn't it be hilarious if Sean played Will Wheaton on our show? Uh, so, and it, so we, we did it in a funny way. Uh, the episode's called Starfleet Academy. And uh, what we did was we, we, had, we, we had Sean shave his beard so he had a baby face. We even put some blush. So he was an adorable young man, you know, uh, so that he could play Will Wheaton. Um, and he really looked scarily like Will Wheaton. It was kind of amazing. Um, and the, the cool thing that happened is, you know, because we did this, uh, Will definitely saw it. You know, he saw his friend playing him. But the thing about the thing about Sean Bonner is he's he's dark. He's he's from uh, from like the hardcore punk scene, um, and he wears black all the time. Um, so he's he's friends with Will Wheaton, and I find that sometimes you know there's there's a little bit of that in Will Wheaton as well. There's a little bit of that dark, uh, you know, riot girl past kind of. Ooh. You know, he he um, he's pretty cool in that way. Sean, yeah. it's funny you mentioned Sean just because I told you talking to Shlomo and also Kent Nichols, Sean was the other guy on that episode of this show mm. that Kent and Shlomo do. I hadn't seen him in years and it was just like I was launching, uh, Carrie and I launched the Backpack Coin, which is this creator token that lives on Rally. And Sean was like making one out of something or rather and had all these like crazy, like it, it was like basically the difference between AOL and the real internet. And, and Sean was the real internet. So it was small world. That's all small. World. <laughs> it is a very small world. Yes. I've got nothing. I, got you know, nothing I, I, was, I was, <laughs> well, I don't know who would play someone, me. I, have to I was talking to someone recently uh, because it's so weird to understand what a small world this is and how when we were online there was there was far less people online and so it was a much smaller community um so for example i don't even remember meeting elon musk but i met him many many years ago yeah wow. and, it, and it, which it's just so funny because i'm like oh oh he was at that party and i met him okay <laughs> you know i don't even remember it um, but that's the kind of tiny world that we have that the marriage between entertainment and technology. What's something from your, your very varied professional past that came in handy in a way you didn't expect? Like, wow, I'm sure glad I know how to play the trombone. Or like <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think I mentioned working at the UN um, and just understanding how to speak to people. Um, and how to show respect in the written form, just uh, how to email people properly. Um, yeah, I think that's that's really important. And that has come into play as I've launched this mentorship program, because I know how to write an email. I know what people are looking for. I know to send a questionnaire in the first email because you don't want to go back and forth, you know, a million times. Um, but I think that everything comes back. Everything comes back. Kate wants you to share a role that you played that you didn't particularly like <laughs> to explain why you didn't like oh it. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. A role that I didn't, oh. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess like, you know, there's there's been a lot of stuff. Not everything is a, uh, is, the most wonder thing, wonderful thing in the world. And sometimes you're just like, yeah, I want to, I want to do a thing. Let's do a thing. And you don't really think about it too much. And then you realize, oh, I have to make out with that guy in multiple takes. Oh, do I want to, how can we fake that? You know, um, <laughs> get a so stunt maker outer. Well, especially in my, in my early days, of acting when, you know, I didn't have all that training. Um, 
it was weird because it's like, oh, now I have to make out with that guy now? You know, like, are, are we sure we want to do guy's like, well, let's like, uh, do it in the name of the job. <laughs> can we cut it? You know, like, do I have to? Um, you know, because also comedy, comedy is very different. Um, and, uh, you know, drama, you have time to get into it. You know, you're like, you're like, okay, we're in love, you know, you, or, or we're passionate and you, you give it the time it needs to get into it so that you can do that scene. Um, but in, you know, the comedy, the, the little web series comedy that I was doing where I had to make out with this dude, that was not fun, you know? I mean, sometimes yeah. you shoot out of order too, right? So you're like, oh, hey, nice to meet you. Uh, today's oh, now, now, now yeah, yeah, today we're hopping scene. into bed. <laughs> mm, mm, Yay. Yeah. I remember reading yeah. that in old films, like in uh, like black and white days, they had tooth paint they would put on people to make their teeth look whiter. And apparently it smelled oh, really rank. And so if you think <sighs> making out with dudes is tough now in the business, apparently it used to be harder. <laughs> well, I seem to remember hearing that... Uh, uh, what's that movie? Gone with the Wind. Apparently, the lead ma male there, the guy with the mustache, um, oh, yeah. had had terrible breath. And Ooh. apparently, she did not want to kiss him and she did not not want to get close to him. So it was almost like he was forcing himself on her and it was just like, she's like squirming to get away. <laughs> but it works for the story. They just made it work. Right? Yeah. Coach it's, it's an interesting you choice. Stunt doubles. We do. And I think that sounds <laughs> like a volunteer right there. <laughs> 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 you know, I'm sure someone has a stunt double for that out there. It's so strange, though, isn't it? Chemistry is a strange thing. So sometimes you'll think, well, that sucked. It, but then there's chemistry on the screen and somehow it's magical. And then other times you do something and you think, woof, that was fun. And then there's just nothing there. When you watch yeah. it on the screen, it falls flat. It's such a strange thing. It is. Yeah. Especially because, you know, the director has to get the shot right and has, you know, it's it's really about like, I find if you, when you look at older films, when they haven't learned, you see really bad kisses, you know, they're just, they're there, but you're not seeing anything, you know, and uh, Clark Gable, I read Gone that. With yeah. the breath. Sorry, <laughs> that's his name. Yeah. Gone with the breath. Oh my goodness. Um, yeah, there's a lot of there was a lot of learning. It's it's a learning process and of what works and um, and early early films you can see sometimes the kissing scenes are, you know, you don't see anything at all because their faces are blocking e each other. Um, I remember very early on learning, you know, where do I want my nose to be? In, in a kiss. You gotta right? pick a side. Yeah. <laughs> you, way, well, you pick way. a side, but it's like, do you want your nose to be on camera or do you want that the other person's nose to be on camera? You know? Or do you want the noses to be smushed together and look really weird? Um, so yeah, no, it's a it's a learning process. You know, you never know what the director wants. Um, when, did you, when do you figure out you gotta pick important. one eye? You gotta pick one eye to look at because otherwise you uh, go yes. back and forth all the time. Yeah, I, I actually have a friend who's very annoyed uh, when he sees new actors who are looking back and forth between the eyes. <laughs> um, and sometimes I notice it too, where you see the you see the actor is like dramatically looking from eye to eye, and you're like, just whoa, whoa, just just pick one, just dude. Pick an eye, just pick an <laughs> eye. <laughs> yeah. Who haven't you worked with that you're dying to work with that you <laughs> ostensibly could work with? Oh boy. I mean, there's so many, right? Uh, let's see. Well, okay. You know what? I wrote a short film and um, I really want Armin Shimmerman to be in it. Ooh. He is an incredible Shakespeare teacher. Not, not only, I mean, he's known for his role as Quark in Star Trek Deep Space Nine and Principal Snyder in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Um, but he's also a wonderful Shakespearean actor, works on stage a lot. Um, and he was, he, I consider him my mentor uh, in Shakespeare. Um, he, I've been to many of his classes and he actually wrote the letter that got me into the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. Um, and he means a lot to me. Um, so I wrote a short film 
uh, that deals with suicide. And uh, it's from a very personal experience from my past. Um, and I would like him to play my father. So, yes, I think that's it's very doable. Um, I've already approached him. He's already read it. And uh, it's really just about getting the production off the ground. Um, we're probably going to have to raise some money on Kickstarter or something at some point. Um, well, send really... us that link for sure. Yeah, put thank it in your you. link tree because we'll want to help. Yeah. Thanks. Is it hard to get a movie like that made now or is it easier to get a movie like that made now? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, it's, it's going to be a question of what happens on Kickstarter, you know? And right. um, the people that... Um, the people that follow me on social media, I've never reached out to them asking for money. Never. Um, and it's so your something favorite that I've... baskets full. <laughs> yeah, like, time. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm hopeful that people would, um, toss a coin to their witcher. Um, and we'll see, you know, we'll see how it goes. I, I have a, a very good friend right now, actually, one of our mentors, uh, Mark Bernardin has just launched his own Kickstarter where he is raising money to direct his first film. It's a short film. Um, but how he, short uh, is short, by the way? And then we'll get right back to that. There's a, how, that's a good question. Of? I I know in my case, uh, my script is only about ten pages long, so it's probably ten minutes or less. Um, and I'm not sure how long Mark Bernardin's short film is going to be, but you know, I mean, usually a short film is less than 40 minutes. So it could be, could be anything. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, we'll he, have him on he when, actually, he, when his short film is coming out or when he that? needs support for it. Let's have him on when his short film is coming right. out yeah. or needs support. Yeah. So you were middle of the story when we cut you off. on. on oh, I was just going to say that we, he, he raised, me. He, um, he asked for $90,000 um, to fund his short film, which is a lot, you know, um, it's, it's, it's a difficult ask, um, but he raised it, I think, within nine hours, um, which is amazing. And I'm so proud of him. And I'm so happy that he has the kind of following that would do that for him, that would believe in him so much that you know, he can actually make that money. And he's been making the stretch goals too, which is amazing. Um, so that's, that's encouraging. And, you know, I don't really know how it would work with me because we're all different and, you know, it's a different film. Um, subject matter is different. Um, you know, so you never know. You really never know. I'm hopeful, obviously. <laughs> Mark's got an interesting past as a writer though, because I mean, he, yeah. he most recently, I guess it was Carnival Row, but, uh, Castle Rock he did, he was, uh, he's done comics for Marvel, DC and Image. I mean, he's he's a pretty busy guy out there doing the work. So uh, maybe that's one way that he gets a, a, a fast raise like that. But you're no slouch in uh, how many places you've been and the things you've done. So maybe it's going to jam again. Plus, the topic is important to a lot of people with mental health issues or people who have challenges or people who have lost someone from that experience uh, or who have found themselves in that position themselves. So there's a lot to think about it with regards to that. But I've got a feeling you'll do all right on your raise. Thank you. I'll definitely be emailing you, Chris. <laughs> no, do it. Shake the tree. We got some stuff. We can connect you. Um, so <laughs> part of the show where we do a couple things. Here's one of them. Oh, and here's our person of the day. Kaboom! I got to look around. Well, you know what? You know who I haven't seen uh, at the show before, I don't think, on, or at least for a while, is Rob Cooper. So we'll give it to Rob. Rob, your person of the day. That entitles you to one free apple. All you have to do is go down to the old grocery store, buy an apple, Wash it up. Uh, Carrie wants me to remind you. Uh, and then it's yours. Free. Wash Have it before you eat it. That's all. For your own good. Of the day. I don't really understand. Is that a cat? Yeah, that's a cat. <laughs> <laughs> With sunglasses on, I guess. God bless Twitch. All right. Well, we're at the backpack question part of the show. This is a question we've asked uh, financial dominatrix, a plain old regular dominatrix, and a lot of other people. <laughs> what goes in your backpack? It could be regular, like as it like, or unleaded. <laughs> uh, what goes in your backpack? It could be something uh, physical, like an avocado. It could be something metaphorical. Carrie, what's a great example of a physical thing that could go in a backpack? A book you hate. 
because eventually you'll read it and learn something from it. Mm, that's a good one. How about something metaphorical like going to backpack? Oh, kindness. Yeah, that'd probably be a good one. Casey McKinnon, what should go in your backpack? So I love the movie Terminator 2. Mm. And it continues to inspire me every day. Because Sarah Connor was a character that I had never seen before. And she was a badass. And I could see that I could fight to be like that too. Um, but there's very specifically the slogan, no fate. There is no fate, but what we make for ourselves. And I think that's really important to remember because nothing, you could sit around and do nothing. You know, you could sit around and do nothing, but if you just do it, Nike slogan, <laughs> um, then you're going to change your life. There is no fate but what you make. And as, Steve Garfield as, says hello. Oh, Steve Garfield. Double Hi, judges Steve. quoting. <laughs> <laughs> She's Terminator not my mother, too. Todd. Todd. <laughs> you know, I have a friend named Todd, and I feel so bad for him because I fight every day to, to not say his name in that, evil sardonic <laughs> way of a teenager I'm just like hey Todd you know <laughs> and he's like oh here we go <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah well my my, my my cat my cat's name is Wolfie by the way no way <laughs> yeah is yeah Wolfie okay hey Janelle what's wrong with Wolfie <laughs> <laughs> nothing yeah. darling Wolfie's just fine Oh, exactly. You can have your show back. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Well, there you go. Term ter I don't know if you want to. If the thing my in my system. backpack is Terminator 2, or it's probably more likely just remembering there is no fate but what we make. Yeah. I think it's I think it's a perfect thing to throw in the backpack. Well, as my grandmother once said, you know, the unknown future rolls towards us, and I, I face it for the first time with a sense of hope. Because if a machine like a Terminator could learn the value of human life, well, maybe we can't. Grandmother. Too.